Thing. Hello, my name is Robert Pajot. Uh, I'm a regeneration project leader here at the National Trust for Canada. Welcome to this gathering of the heritage sector, COP26 and climate heritage action, seizing momentum and the heritage reset. It's going to be a great session here today. Um, I am coming to you from Ottawa here today, the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Uh, we know that all of you are joining from different parts of the country and from uh, around the world, in fact. So we encourage you to join us in reflecting on the, the histories, languages, and cultures of the Indigenous peoples on, the, on whose land and whose presence continues to enrich the lands on which we are all uh, sharing in this joint heritage. Um, just a few logistical start, uh, notes to start the session. Um, les présentations aujourd'hui seront, uh, seront entièrement en anglais. Cependant, on vous encourage de mettre vos commentaires en français et on va se faire un plaisir de faire la traduction sur le champ. Um, logistical notes. This, as you will see, uh, you're going to be seeing a bunch of faces on the screen. This is an, uh, as a meeting and not a Zoom webinar. So um, you will be invited after our, presenter, our presenters have had a chance to make their, uh, their opening remarks. You will have the opportunity to, to join in the conversation. So please remain muted. Make sure your, your, uh, your microphone is muted and uh, you can leave your camera on or off uh, during the, 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 the session. Um, and when we open up the lines, I will ask you to raise your hand, uh, the virtual hand that you'll find in your settings and we will unmute you and uh, we'll identify you and hopefully uh, have a great conversation um, uh, when, we, when we get to that in, in a few minutes. The session is being recorded and so not to worry if you've missed anything, you will be getting a recording of the session uh, in, uh, via email in the next uh, 24 hours or so. So with that, I'm just uh, maybe flip the slide. Uh, my colleague Holly in the background can flip the slide forward. Um, just a quick note about the National Trust for those of you that aren't familiar with us, uh, the National Trust for Canada. These gatherings are really an important part of what we do at the National Trust to build and strengthen the heritage community across the country. It's through sessions like this and through our national conference uh, and other programs like our launch pad um, that we really work to empower um, the people that use and uh, use and love heritage across the country. And, and we truly do believe that historic places and heritage buildings and sites offer incredible opportunities to uh, contribute in an ongoing way to, to our communities. So this is this gathering is just one of the, the items, uh, our programs that we run and it's on all of our social media. Um, so, and with that, um, I am going to now turn it over to our moderator for the session, uh, Chris Weeb. Chris. Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, yes, I'm Chris Weeb, and I'm uh, here on the traditional unceded territory, the Algonquin Anishinaabe people as well, here in Ottawa. Uh, I'm the um, manager for heritage policy and government relations at the National Trust, and I am super excited about today's session. Uh, I think like a lot of you, I was watching uh, intermittently a lot of these COP 26 events, so looking forward to hearing more about it today from our international panelists. But before I introduce them to you, I just want to mention this project here that's up on the screen uh, with the big red button. Um, it's a project that uh, the National Trust for Canada calls uh, the Heritage Reset, and we have many other partners around the country uh, who are helping us on this. And those of you who participated in uh, the National Trust Conference 2021 uh, virtually this past fall would have seen some of these materials um, and been involved even in conference discussions that posed questions to stakeholders in the heritage field um, looking at uh, looking at this whole idea of the heritage reset Holly can you go to the next slide please so here we're I mean four kind of high level questions that we were asking um, trying to look at this kind of idea of the reset or the realignment or the shift in heritage. I think a lot of other um, organizations like the National Trust for Historic Preservation in this US is looking at an impact agenda. Uh, our, our colleagues in the National Trust in Australia are also looking at um, you know, uh, how they uh, integrate with uh, cur uh, current societal uh, concerns uh, more, more firmly, more elegantly. Um, so at the conference and uh, in, in, in the next, in the year ahead even, we wanna be asking tough questions to make sure that the work we do in the heritage sector, the language we use, 
the way we practice um, are really aligned and demonstrate their contributions to overall uh, overarching social concerns uh, and other concerns in society. Um, so we had a lot of dynamic conversations at the conference around, you know, how heritage can be diverse and inclusive, how it can reflect the diversity of our country. Um, we also asked questions about, you know, the approach to heritage actors, uh, the approach heritage actors take in um, commenting on development proposals uh, and how we're perceived by those who focus on climate action. Um, so today, Will be an opportunity to reflect on what the public uh, public perceives heritage is asking for and what we are promoting and looking forward to that informing some of our discussion next slide please so on to today's panelists and we have a uh, international cast uh, but first i want to just say a, a one word a couple words about uh, the chn the climate heritage network it's um the, all of the people involved today are involved in that organization. It was set up in 2019, and it's a voluntary neutral support network of arts, culture, and heritage organizations committed to aiding their communities in tackling climate change and achieving the ambitions of the Paris Agreement. Uh, it's, it's become an incredible uh, forum uh, and connector for uh, people concerned uh, in terms of trying to make those interconnections between uh, cultural heritage and uh, climate action, and uh, it was it had a huge presence, a very big presence, formative presence at COP26 in Glasgow. So who do we have today uh, that was there and is going to be helping us guide us through what they learned and uh, some of the uh, takeaways that they that they came uh, came away with. So we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Ewan Hislop, and he's the uh, European co-chair of the Climate Heritage Network but he's also the head of technical research and science at Historic Scotland. And he's coming to us from Edinburgh and he was there in Glasgow uh, just at the beginning of November. And then from uh, a world away, Julianne Polanco, uh, she's actually in California and she's the co-chair of the Climate Heritage Network as well. And she, uh, her other uh, hat is as a historic, as a state historic preservation officer at the California Office of Historic Preservation. And she's coming to us bright and early from Sacramento, California. And then uh, here in Canada, we have um, uh, Mark Thompson Brandt, uh, and he is a, a senior conservation architect, urbanist, and founding principal at MTBA Associates Incorporated. He's also worked on uh, the Climate Heritage Network's uh, working group number three, among many other things. And in addition, he is a co-chair of the Zero Net Carbon Collaboration for existing and historic buildings, uh, which, is a, which is a professional group, but also uh, invites others to participate as well. Maybe Mark can characterize it more fulsomely later on. And he's in Ottawa, Ontario. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Holly, maybe you can take down the slide. Um, what I wanted to do was to start um, with you and Julianne and Mark to just get a, a sense, I guess from you uh, and Julianne particularly, because they were on the ground in Glasgow. Mark was an avid consumer of <laughs> COP26 events from afar in Canada. I want to get a sense from each of you, just with some opening uh, thoughts of about seven minutes or so around um, you know what your uh, some of the events that went on there uh, at COP26, what, what it was like to be involved there, the kind of the sense of it, and some of your key takeaways uh, from that. Maybe I'll start with you, Ewan, because uh, you were there, you're still there in Scotland, and if you could <laughs> give us your sense, that'd be fantastic. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think the the. The, the COP environment is a it, it's a crucible and, and and a bubble and very very intense, um, quite um, quite an, an out of this world experience for the for the two weeks of, of of the COP itself. But I think the key point is that most of the work is done before the COP. Um, uh, it's the icing on the cake, and certainly in our case, in terms in, in the terms of the Climate Heritage Network and getting culture and cultural heritage onto the agenda, it was all about the run up. And that run up was was two years. It, it was from the founding of the, the launch of the of the CHN in uh, October 2019 and uh, COP25 in Madrid uh, in, in December 2019, where um, the network launched the um, the so-called Madrid to Glasgow Action Plan. Um, 
And that was um, a series of um, working groups um, of members, voluntary members from throughout the network involving dozens of members, um, a huge effort over those two years to develop a series of work streams um, across the um, cultural heritage agenda and the broad arts, culture and heritage agenda indeed, um, to develop um, uh, uh, resources and offerings um, which would gain traction at the COP. So, so um, what that looked like at COP was something like um, I, I, I think I think it's I think it was about sixteen CHN sponsored cultural heritage events within the green and blue zones in the COP. So at, at the heart of the decision making area area with, with, within COP, and those events. Um, were across a, a very broad agenda. So um, reaching different areas of where cultural heritage can inform and add to climate action. So um, maybe familiar agendas like, like um, heritage regeneration, retrofit and resource efficiency in terms of supporting circular economy agendas. Um, looking at the um, expressing the, the role of arts, culture and heritage in terms of um, supporting um, uh, resilient, sustainable development, the role of our sector in terms of um, and heritage, heritage in terms of building um, food and agricultural resilience, um, exploring the value of indigenous knowledge and contributing to, to climate resilience. Um, lessons in terms of the historic and the vernacular built environment in terms of the construction agenda mo moving forward. Um, so, um, I, I, and the importance of heritage policies in terms of driving climate action. So a whole host of um, areas that we'd identified in CHN as being of value to um, engaging with the, with the international uh, climate policy development areas, which would be be, di be discussed at, at the COP. And what that um, is looking like now, after a, a, a very frenzied two weeks uh, at the COP, is a series of resources which have come out um, of, of these working groups. Um, and you can see some of that on the CHN website. There's a new series of pages there, um, I think it's called the resource library, which is work in progress. But a number of the outputs from these are now, are now have, have now been put up on this site. And in fact, we, we started putting them up just at the start of COP. And there's there's five areas there from, from various working groups, representing a huge amount of input from across the membership. But those areas encompass some of those key themes at the COP. So, and it, you know, a couple of examples of that would be the importance of cultural heritage and climate planning. So, and, and that presents the results of um, one of the working groups, working group four, um, which is a, a which is an online report, which which you can see there on the on, on the web pages, which gives a, a, a sort of snapshot examples of how well um, or otherwise cultural heritage is included in climate change policy and planning at national governmental level, regional levels, and local levels. Um, other information there is um, a project led, led by Mark, in fact, on um, entitled Building Reuses Climate Action. So that's looking at the um, uh, quantifying the carbon involved in um, construction and the savings from reuse. So detailing the reuse of existing buildings and supporting greenhouse gas reduction uh, with a whole host of um, specific examples and, and case studies and also describing additional benefits such as retention of traditional local skills and material supply chains. Um, there's other, the, the working group seven has produced a series of models on climate action by uh, local communities and indigenous people. So looking at the value of um, practices of local knowledge, which of course are often linked to a deep understanding of local environments um, and, 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 and enhancing sustain environmental sustainability and harnessing cultural resources to do that. Um, so, and again, there's examples there about sort of um, valuable cultural heritage practices in terms of land management, agricultural practices, um, and indeed cultural heritage driving sustainable development in city center populations. 
Um, there's a communications toolkit, which is the result of working group one, which is essentially, um, effectively it's an advocacy guide for cultural heritage players so all of us um, to help us um, better engage and amplify our vo our voices in terms of the value that cultural heritage has to play in climate action and developing climate policy some terrific resources there to support our sector and and um, amplify our voices um, and there's forthcoming resources there um, in terms of um, helping develop strategies for strengthening sustainable development um, whilst promoting transformative action and the role of cultural heritage in helping drive, drive those agendas. So um, I'd, I'd recommend um, you take a look at the Climate Heritage Network website where you'll, you'll see um, these emerging resources under this um, resource library pages. Um, and I think that gives a good flavour of the, um, the range uh, and the depth of some of the activities that the network was uh, rolled out um, at, at COP26. Thanks so much, Ewan. And I think we'll circle back around, you know, high level takeaways uh, after this. And yes, I should have mentioned right off the bat, I mean, the fact that there are six uh, working groups that are um, that have really been driving, haven't been, been involved and sort of seen up close one of them. Uh, it's been a lot of coordination, a lot of international input to try to get these products forward uh, and tremendous collaboration and uh, creation of those networks, activation of those networks. So it's been really inspiring to see that. Uh, and so you, at, on, the, on the website, you'll probably see like the top of the iceberg, as it were. But uh, there's so much going on and uh, encourage others to get involved in some of these working groups, ones involved around uh, revolving around value and traditional knowledge, uh, communicating uh, heritage as climate action, the building reuse case, uh, you know, as a uh, case making. Um, there's others there and yeah, have a look on the CHN website for more information. Why don't I throw it over to uh, Julianne uh, there uh, to give her kind of sense of um, some of the activities that went on there uh, in Glasgow uh, and, uh, and, 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 and her takeaways. Hi, good morning from Marin County, California, where I am um, respectfully acknowledged that I am on the land of the coast, the traditional land of the Coast Maywook people, many of whom are today citizens of the Federated Indians of the Great Rancheria. And I think Ewan gave a really good overview of the many different activities that the Climate Heritage Network both drove um, as well as participated in in the lead up to COP um, and definitely the presence that we had um, with our delegation there. Though we were five on the ground official delegates every week, we were many in depth um, both virtually and, um, and on the groups in lead up. So I really, um, I really wanna celebrate and honor the fact that it was uh, a collective effort of hundreds of people around the world, like-minded and purposed to ensure that the voices and the values of culture and heritage and communities are present and contributing to climate solutions. Um, in addition to the maybe 16 that the Climate Heritage Network specifically sponsored, we had speakers in several different um, other sectors and other conversations around finance, around just transition. Um, and one really, I think, important point to, to highlight about the COP is that the, cult, the Climate Heritage Network is also now one of 24 entities in the United Nations Race to Resiliency um, effort. It's, a, it's an effort with high-level champions who are um, in the next uh, five years looking at how to focus on um, urban, rural, coastal communities, culture, um, uh, agriculture, um, and, and really understand how resiliency is going to be driven and, um, and available for communities going, going on. So this, this race to zero, um, there were hundreds of groups and organizations around the world from all levels who applied, 24 were selected, and that whole resiliency hub was a really critical part of the Climate Heritage Network's um, participation as well, both at COP and going forward. So how we weave the work that we've done in the working groups 
um, and the work that we're yet to do when we, we sort of figure out now what's next, how do we keep that momentum going, the race to resiliency will be one of those. Um, we also created a, a manifesto, which is on the Climate Heritage Network um, website. We'll talk a little bit more about it later, but I just wanted to highlight that that is a, is a document that talks about and really centers around accelerating climate action through the power of arts, culture, and heritage to create uh, a low carbon future. Um, it's, it's a document that also can serve as um, some talking points for folks and, and a primer to people who are trying to understand the intersection um, I'll say that the experience of COP just from a sort of what happens there, because it really is a an alternate reality world is thousands of people are in a giant conference room running around trying to listen to and participate in and share and connect with as many people as possible. Um, it might have been you and who likened it to living for two weeks in the airport uh, lobby uh, in a, a large airport lobby with way too many people in there, but it was just this really interesting, all of the all of the delegates that were doing the negotiating and the high level government officials were on one physical end of the COP and then the rest of the delegate, the delegates and the um, observers were in these big um, open spaces and the pavilions were rooms, conference rooms, um, some looked like living rooms, all in an effort to share information um, and to connect with others who are doing some other things or might have similar intersections. I mean, I think the best value and the, and the sort of biggest um, thing that I can say about the experience with COP is that I think people are aware of culture and they're aware of communities, but I think it really resonated some at such a higher level in this COP that if we really are to meet this urgency, we do need all hands on deck and that culture delivers people. It connects us to place. And it helps bring that voice that seems to be missing from these global conversations, connecting local to global. And all of that along the way is what's going to be needed to meet this urgency. I think that it was um, incredibly hopeful. I think it was really positive. People were excited to understand how music plays a role and how museums can play a role in helping communities understand um, managed retreat, for example. Um, and and then the number of levels um, of, of these kinds of intersections and the possibility of sharing and learning was really present. Um, I think when I got home and processed all of that information on a couple of hours of sleep every night. What what I took away were, was, was COP a success? And I think the answer is it was, but it's really clear that without people, we're not gonna get anywhere. And without connecting communities for greater ambition, the global conversations will continue to happen, but really where the, where the, the progress will happen is on the ground. And that really does need to be inclusive of communities. And it's an amazing opportunity. And I think the energy and the positive nature of the work that the Climate Heritage Network brought to the table um, was really, was positive and is gonna help make these sea changes that we need to continue to, to get to that low carbon future. So I'll, I'll stop there and, um, and turn it back to you, Chris. Thanks, Julianne. Thanks for that. And I think, you know, it's uh, it's, it's great to see. And I mean, uh, the Climate Heritage Network was instrumental in, in weaving that kind of conversation throughout the COP in a, in a, in a big way for one of the first times at these events. And uh, it's, it's, it's great to see that I mean, when it comes to the conversations, a lot of it circles around technical solutions, but it's, it's in, 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 in those kind of answers, but it's the cultural shift and uh, that's gonna really be the one that drives it, uh, drives it for people and makes, that, makes those kind of sea changes that you're mentioning we need to have. Uh, so now over to Mark Brandt and he um, was, was deeply embedded. I think Ju he and Julianne were both co-chairs, many hats, of uh, working group three, looking at building reuse and making the case for that. So he came maybe with 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 that with those kind of goggles on to uh, to cop, but I think you were observing other things. Mark, do you want to give your impressions and takeaways uh, at this point? Yeah, for sure. And thanks very much, Chris. It's uh, it's really great to be involved in this. Uh, having an international scope is so important, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and Julianne and you and are uh, two of the very best, as I've been working with them for the last. Well, uh, since Julianne hosted the, the mobilization in San Francisco in 2018, so the last three years, I guess, 
and it's been a wild ride and cop was really just the the tip of the iceberg to use your phrase um it was uh it was incredible even from afar um i i could not go but i i did spend a lot of time following along and um you and, and julie covered a lot of good points which i won't repeat so i want to talk a little bit about some of the other things i i I tuned into, um, there were um, people, communities from Africa that were talking about what uh, their culture meant to them and how that connected uh, to uh, the environmental threats that they face because of uh, climate chaos and um, all different places of the world. And that was really eye-opening for me. Another one was Architecture 2030, which has become um, an organization well, well respected, um, deeply embedded in quality research, and um, they they were there. Uh, they had a they had a, like a manifesto of their own. Um, I think they called it something different, but it was really a call to try and get um, the larger groups. Um, uh, major players in the in the in the uh, related sectors to to come together and to take this step, and I think um, it's it's it really opened my eyes to how yeah like you mentioned the technical and the cultural, Chris, but um, it's it's so much more than that. But it is that, and by that I mean we need everybody on board. This this is a global problem, a global challenge. And um, we can't sit in little silos, whether it's little siloed communities, little siloed people working on a little project or, or even siloed sectors or even siloed nations. We have to work together. And that's why things like this very conversation that you're all participating in right now is so important because we're bringing an international perspective, but we're also bringing it, well, I guess part of my role is to bring it home to Canada. And certainly I think um, opportunities for greenhouse gas reduction are so broad. They're so broad. We, we, we spew greenhouse gas in so many different ways. And I've just spent the last decade traveling the continent saying how existing buildings are really where it's at, you know, because it's 40% of greenhouse gases and the building industry wasn't listening. They've just started listening. And in fact, in Canada here, the Canada Green Building Council just issued a couple of days ago um, a, a, a new um, uh, a roadmap for how we're going to decarbonize the largest buildings in the country. And that's a great start. Um, but we need everybody. We need all buildings. We need everything. And I think the building sector is more powerful or more um, responsible, if you will, um, because of opportunities for greenhouse gases being so broad. And when you think of the Canada's uh, resource-based economy, all of the mining and the oil and the um, farming and the forestry, all of those things that we do that um, cause climate change, um, we, we have to get everywhere. And with, from a building's perspective, that's all that embodied carbon. So all of those um, stones that were uh, hewn from the ground and transported and then built all, uh, using, you know, cranes using fossil fuels, et cetera. You, all of that embodied carbon is is real, but it's it's so broad that you could really take anyone from anywhere and help them understand how they're going to uh, fight climate change with the rest of us. So coordination is, is everything. And um, I told Chris earlier that the top three things that we have to learn um, about uh, where to go next and how to do this right. Now that we've got a, a, um, uh, a, a listening audience that um, cultural heritage does matter and does play a role, um, the top three things are number one, communication, two, communication, and three, communication. We have to communicate why we, like at COP, it, it was, in a way of coming out because uh, so little had done been done in cultural heritage before that at any other cop before that. But now we, we can't lose the momentum. We have to carry this on and get across 
to uh, particularly the financial sector and the political sector. Um, and one of the ways that we can get the political sector on side, uh, besides recommending great policy, um, is to get more people involved. And that's why the cultural heritage sector is again great because people become engaged through cultural heritage. So we get more people involved. You know, climate in, the climate environment is everything and it's everywhere. Um, we need more people like that. And I, I can talk later more about the working group three, some of the things that we did. And I can talk a little bit more about the zero net carbon collaboration, which in fact does that very thing that I'm promoting here, which is trying to bring the various organizations together so that we work in harmony and that we're a, a you know, a, a nicely directed symphony orchestra instead of a, a, a bunch of noises going off in all directions. And like they say, uh, there's, a, there's a smug saying about the world needs more Canada. And I, I would say the Climate Heritage Network needs more Canadians to be involved in it. And I think you're gonna see even more great things coming out of the Climate Heritage Network. And I would like to see more of my Canadian friends and colleagues being a part of that. And I think you'll get very justly rewarded for it. I'll leave it at that for now, Chris. Thanks so much, Mark. And uh, yeah, no, I think about just building on and uh, yeah, you've been a key player in this for, for a long time. I mean, with building resilience, that essential kind of guidebook to adapting buildings, among other things. And I know you've really had your eyes on this file for, for over a decade. Um, thinking about that communication, 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 I'm wondering, you know, and what Ewan said earlier about how a lot of materials had been, you know, developed in advance and brought to COP. From, for Ewan and Julianne, like, what was it, I mean, how did those, how did those uh, messages, how did those arguments, how did those communication tools that were created in advance, how did they land? I mean, what were you hearing in that big airport lobby, as you characterize it as? Uh, I mean, wh what was resonating? And maybe what wasn't, or what do we need to work on as a as a community? I think we have a lot of internal conversations around what we think the world needs to hear in terms of asserting our our, our presence and our, our contribution to um, to climate action. But I'm just wondering what uh, what you know what played out on the ground there, and if do you have any insights from uh, from that? Uh, yeah, I, I can kick off on that, Chris. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, that, that was one of the realizations early on in CHN was that, that that we needed to equip ourselves with the tools, with the toolkits to to have those dialogues and and to 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 make the make the difference. And I guess like many other sectors, we we're very comfortable talking to our own folk, but um, you know we need to get out of our comfort zones and we need to put ourselves in difficult situations with with people who don't normally we don't normally engage with and and. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we had a, a sense of that at the COP and that was part of the purpose of what, what, what we did. And because of the pre-preparation, I, I think we were in a good position and a lot of messages were, were listened to and, and, and that was really great to hear. But, you know, equally, equally, I, I don't think we, we were um, in any doubt about the enormity of the task ahead of us in terms of getting heritage onto the, onto other people's agendas and to be to be part of the part of the action to um, get the message across that we have solutions to other people's problems. Um, I, I mean, we, there were some terrific events and it's easy maybe to talk about the successful ones, but I mean, one of the more challenging ones for me was um, a, a meeting in the at, at the Global Alliance of uh, the Global ABC, Global Alliance for, for Building and Construction. Uh, 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 in, in the blue zone at COP. And I went along to this meeting, um, which was about making the business case for a circular economy for the construction industry. Now I thought, yeah, this is, this is, this is great for, this is what we do, this is super. But I wasn't hearing anything about heritage in there at all. And I, I was sitting in on this meeting and there was a launch of an international circular economy building design toolkit um, it was Arab, in fact, so very, very international, big, big construction players. They launched four principles uh, for, for um, circular economy. The first principle being build nothing. The second being build for the long term and uh, longevity. Then 
after that, looking at resource usage and um, reducing the use of new materials. And the fourth principle was reducing high carbon materials. But it was like, hey, hey, guys, hang on. Can we go back to number one, please? Because we have a terrific resource in the existing built environment, which has got so many answers. Um, and in terms of the the, the conservation uh, and the, the the regeneration, retrofit, etc., of that built environment, there's terrific um, benefits in terms of circular economy, in terms of um, looking at local sources of materials, uh, looking at um, local jobs and employment, and um, true circular economy solutions right there staring us in the face in the large percentage of existing buildings that we have around us, particularly those that are of traditional construction. And, you know, that that's an uphill job, you know, trying to get these people to listen. And a lot of that meeting was taken up by, the, there was uh, there was someone from the, I don't know, the International the World Steel Federation, I, I don't have the right title, talking about steel as being the most environmentally friendly material because it can be taken out of buildings, melted down and reused again. And it's like, whoa, 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 can we just wind this back, please? So um, I won't go on about that anymore, but sure, you know, as, as Mark says, communication, communication, we, we have to put ourselves into these uncomfortable situations out of our own comfort zone, get those messages out there because we do have solutions to these problems. And core to what we need to be conscious of is that heritage is part of the solution. We're not part of the problem. And you know, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an uphill job for us, but but we've got we've got a lot to offer. Thanks, yeah. Julian, for that for that insight. Go, yeah, go for it, Julian. And I was just going to say, if if there's others that want to jump in with their hand, there's the reactions button down at the bottom with the raised hand, uh, and then uh, you can speak uh, live if you want to ask a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Julian. I was just going to say, I think I think you know, you and described that built environment meeting, and but but it, you could change the topic, and there were similar situations and reactions where. People were speaking our language, but just didn't know they were speaking our language and didn't know that we could be a partner and what climate, her what heritage and culture could contribute to these conversations in a value added way, sometimes driving action more than, than they, and sometimes just helping accelerate what, what they're already trying to do. And so I think for, for me, one of the things that, that, that was hard to focus on was the volume. Um, we at the Climate Heritage Network really tried to pick, we started out with 10 in the, what we call the Madrid to Glasgow plan. And those are the products that Ewan had mentioned that are now visible and available on the website. And, and you know, the Climate Heritage Network will look at how we continue with that effort. But it seemed like for every, for the 10 that we focused on, there were hundreds more and lots of little rabbit holes to go down. And it sometimes feels really overwhelming and it certainly did it cop. And I would say that for all of us as practitioners, we all have our specifics. And then whether you're an archeologist or you're in um, about community preservation or, or built environment, um, there, there are some museum and museums and collections. There are so many things that we are already doing that I would say if you're trying to understand where you can enter the conversation, how you can make a difference, it would be really, so what are you doing? What interests you? And what do your communities need? And I guarantee you somebody else has thought about it. Somebody else is probably working on it um, or somebody else is interested in partnering with you to do that. And that's the beauty and the whole purpose of the Climate Heritage Network is to really not start everybody from scratch in the hundreds and thousands of ways, but to say, how do we band together to, to do this more quickly and to share knowledge and to share information. Um, I think that the manifesto, and when you look at it, it talks about nature-based solutions. And we talk about how culture plays a role in um, the urgency of, of mobilization and ambition um, about uh, gender and climate. And so any topic that you're potentially interested in, the, the manifesto is a way to help sort of um, frame those conversations. And I would also say the second thing that I think is really important that everybody can do is one of the groups looked at climate policy and where in the world all the global 
climate action policies, um, both at federal and state local levels was culture present and it's woefully inadequate. Um, we are striving to do that in California by including uh, culture in a task force that we have in the state. We started this with no money and no additional staff and kept it going during COVID. And, and if nothing else, it's raised awareness internally in state government to say, while you're looking at restocking uh, a river to look at fish and, and, and can you look at food security for tribes or can you look at traditional cultural materials that are needed for basketry, for example. And so how do we help people see those value added connections that are critical to communities? And I think swimming through the overwhelming um, availability of topics, the, the way to do that is really to think about what do your communities need? What, are, what skill set do you bring to the table? And what are the connections or the, the things that you have that you think would be helpful to making those, those collaborations more successful? And I think that we can get sort of overwhelmed by the volume as climate change is such a big topic, um, but there really are things that we can do to make a difference in that collective nature. Um, I think it was the Fijian president who, when they had COP on their very little island, talked about everybody has a place in the conversation, culture especially, and then that, that is gonna bring us all together in a, in a way that binds us um, in all of these different as facets of climate action. So the one thing that I took away from it is to not get overwhelmed by um, the volume. And there's so many interesting things to do, but really to think about what do your communities need and how and how can you play a role in helping with that? That's really great, Julianne. And I think this whole idea of like the manifesto, and I think we haven't, I mean, doing that work of articulating um, a, a, a kind of a, a, a framework for seeing uh, change and uh, is, is, is super, super important. We haven't done, as a cultural heritage community, we haven't really done some of that work in the past. And so it really helps us uh, advance, advance things and uh, take it forward. Mark, I wanted to shift to you. I don't know, I'm waiting for, if, if some people have some questions, please raise your hand and, uh, or put it in the chat. We'll try to, try to get to it. Mark, I was just wondering about um, thinking about uh, the, the the building reuse side of things and um, one of the things launched was that care tool that carbon avoided retrofit calculator um, and can you give us uh, a kind of an overview of what what that is and what the kind of the impact could be and what's what's the next steps on that front sorry mark i think you're uh, muted How's oh, that? Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Sorry, silenced. Sorry about that. So um, the care tool, some of you may have uh, learned about it uh, when it was called the uh, to build or not to build tool. It's now called the care tool and care stands for carbon avoided um, retrofit estimator. And it's about, um, it's an early stage or early project tool that you look at um, before you're getting into the technical changes, when you uh, it's it's especially for districts, communities, campuses, where you have a number of buildings and you're trying to decide how to go forward. You know, some buildings are falling apart. Should you fix them or should you replace them, etc. And the care tool uh, looks at the carbon impact of of all of your different options with that. So it's really at a sort of pre-design stage or a planning stage that it's most useful. Um, it has received two grants. Um, one is a wonder grant, <coughs> uh, which helped uh, get it up and running. It's now received a Mo grant from the uh, US National Trust. And so the prime uh, um, uh, creators of the tool of the tool, which is Larry Strain, with the firm of um, Siegel and Strain in Julie's neck of the woods in the Bay Area, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, my co-chair on the on the Zero Net Carbon collaboration, Julie, sorry, Laurie Ferris, uh, who's an architect in Boston, 
and a, another architect, um, Aaron McDade, who works with Architecture 2030. And what they've what they've started doing, they got pretty sophisticated with it as an Excel tool. And now they're trying to make it a web-based tool with this latest uh, grant. Um, it's it's now at a point where um, you can you can use it anywhere in North America. Um, you put in your uh, postal code, I think it is, and um, it has listed whether you're on a dirty grid or a clean grid. So, for instance, in Quebec, all of the power comes from hydropower, so it's a very clean grid. Um, in Kentucky. Um, most of the uh, power comes from coal, uh, so you're on a dirty grid. So it takes in really sort of broad scale um, variables, and then it um, gets right down to um, very specific um, aspects if you're planning out this district or campus, and what is the best way to go. And what we're finding, of course, um, is that rehabilitation and retrofit is almost always um, much better for the environment. The other, the other thing that it, it, it represents, at least for those of us who are involved in it uh, through the um, zero net carbon collaboration, um, is it's really helping us to show that um, people involved in the rehabilitation of the built environment, especially in heritage buildings, but it could be any existing buildings, um, including modern era buildings of which there are very many and of which are going to be a major change to our carbon accounting. Um, those of us who are working in those areas really have a large responsibility and, and Julie um, and Ewan have both said, you know, we have a lot to offer. And I think um, that offer, what we have to offer is also a, uh, a responsibility and so because we really do have to make a paradigm shift and this sort of consump consumptive behavior has to change but the building sector itself has to change and we're just starting to see it now so it's a little a little behind considering where we need to go um, within the next nine years and then the following 20. So we think that the, the top 10 reasons for that would be uh, the fact that we are multidisciplinary and there's a huge need for that urban cl urgent collaboration amongst disciplines. Um, we have um, great experience with determining value and that value, we've used it with heritage value, but it's, it's easy to switch over to economic or environmental or sociocultural value as well, where a lot of this sort of, uh, you know, the, the just the just build back um, is, uh, is part of that. Um, minimal intervention because finding simpler ways and, and minimizing materials is, is a huge part of keeping our, our, uh, our carbon down. And the fact that uh, many people in this sector, this sort of uh, uh, cultural heritage built environment sector, um, know about small buildings and large buildings and know how to scale from one to the other. Um, we also have a, a, a skill of ability to deal with old buildings at a variety of ages and, and understand how they, they represent very different obstacles or constraints. Um, maintainability and durability, I mean, that's what, um, that's what we do in the heritage sector, right? Understanding advantages of local materials um, traditional buildings were more often than not built from local materials. So uh, we've got a lot of experience there. The fact that heritage conservation is environmental conservation. They're one in the same thing. As you and said, we're starting from a position of strength here. Um, and, and I would just add, you know, this, this understanding about global collaboration. And now we see things like the Climate Heritage Network, involvement with COP, um, and really a lot of collaboration happening between um, heritage organizations with more mainstream building organizations, whether it's Architecture 2030 or the uh, Global ABC, the Global um, Building Construction, sorry, Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, Global ABC. Th these are like major sector players that we now have to start engaging with. Like Ewan says, 
maybe get out of our comfort zone a little bit and start playing at the table with these people because um, they need us. And of course we need them because they're gonna be major players in making these changes. So oh, yeah, Mark, just jumping in here. I mean, I was thinking like you're running out of uh, runway here. Uh, we got about uh, eight, nine minutes left. Marty Party asked a question, uh, maybe for Ewan or maybe Julianne, about uh, the new build, retrofit, adaptive reuse kind of communities and their interaction. I think you spoke a little bit to that, Ewan, in terms of you know your discussions with the steel fabricators. Look, are they? Do they? Are they on the same page with heritage? Are they seeing the value of that, or do we need to do some more work? Uh, it, it, as Mark indicated early, earlier, it, it, it's early days. Um, I think they're beginning to see there are solutions out there and they're looking beyond their confined horizons um, and, and, and seeing us. And if we're there to engage, that, that, that's what's going to make the difference. And we need to be speaking their language um, and have, to, have the right um, solutions for, for what they need. So I think there has been a fundamental shift, a recognition um, of the, the potential uh, that we can bring to to the table, because these guys need they need solutions. I mean, the, the you know the the construction industry is um, a massive contributor of of waste and of of carbon. It's not a circular business, and you know globally, many governments are moving towards circular economy business models. Um, they're going to need us. They might not know it yet, um, but they do. And I think the additionality that we can bring is the wider benefits. So the fact that through the reuse, the, the, the reuse, the retrofit, the regeneration of existing buildings and places, we are preserving community values, community cohesion. We are uh, enhancing local supply chains. We are, um, there's a whole series of benefits that we in the heritage sector know about because that's what that's what we do that, that that's the added value um, and we need to put those things on the table um uh to 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 add weight to to our argument Just trying to fold together in the interest of time thanks you and thinking about uh, some of the questions that are coming in around ethical funding of finance and how heritage uh, rehabilitation can fit into those kind of ESG funds, other things. That's a question. Another question is around building codes and whether that came up or whether it was too down in the, you know, too down in the weeds for this the discussion at COP. I'm not sure. But did those those are other sort of big challenges? I think stand in the way in a lot of different communities. Did those, did those come up or or Julian? Did you have some other things you wanted to flag building off of you? And um, I think that they did come up. I think they were in very tangential ways. There wasn't a lot of time to deep dive, but I think they certainly were conversations. Can we, uh, you know, California just as we're, we're about to release um, a state tax credit uh, regulation um, effort. And we asked our legislature, can we add points for carbon reduction retrofits that will, um, that will help us encourage those kinds of projects to receive the tax credits over ones that don't. And we were told, good idea, not now. So we just have to keep talking. We have to keep thinking about how to make these connective points. Our, our CAL FIRE folks are working on uh, in, in the governor's budget with millions, billions of dollars on climate change and fire hardening of buildings. Um, you know, housing shortages exist all over the world. Fire hardening and, and an increased heat and, and certainly the fires that we've seen in California, no conversation about historic buildings. So we have a plug and play how to even think about these things that was that we put together for seismic retrofit that we're handing over in a way to educate people about the historic nature of their, their personal homes and what that looks like in a fire hardening situation. So how do we do what we know how to do, which is re rehabilitate buildings and save sites and the values of culture to communities and the value of holistic solutions to places, not just one-off solutions, but we have to show up make those connecting points for people, that whole communication that Mark said. And then as Ewan said, bring the solutions to the table. People are desperate to be making more progress. Big communities, big developers are looking for ways to, um, to do the right thing. Uh, and, and also I think we shouldn't be naive to say they have PR problems that culture can help solve. And so 
are we too proud to say we bring all of these things to the table? I think not. And I think that doesn't mean that we get in bed with the devil, but we all have a world that we need to, to, to look after and the ways that we can bring benefit and, and, and progress to the table for our communities are, are endless. Um, and so how we do that, I think, is really up to us. It, it needs policy. It needs communication. It needs solutions. We need to look at our toolkits and say we can adapt them for we can adapt seismic upgrades to our seismic retrofits to fire hardening. Can we adapt it to something else? How do we use indigenous knowledge to think about um, the way we're building things differently, the way the buildings sit in the landscape to accommodate um, airflow that we seem to have lost. And so there's so many different things that we have that knowledge. We just have to do a better job about packaging it, about finding those inroads and, um, and, 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 and ways to bring those, uh, those connective solutions to the table. And I will just say that everybody advocate, get on boards. I just am getting on the board of the Urban Land Institute Sustainability Committee, which has nothing to do with historic preservation. And that's the problem. So find yourselves in an uncomfortable table that might not be where you would normally be and start making those inroads. And I think we can, I think we can do it together collectively. That's a great, ULI that's a great is a spur to action. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Mark. I was just going to say ULI is a good one because those are players that, you know, have billions of dollars of development. Uh, that, that, that's the, that's the, the sandbox that they play in. Um, it, it is about communicating our value because we, we know that we have the value, but that's not good enough. We have to communicate that. And uh, just on the codes, I want to um, bring forward some good news. Um, in Canada, and I believe California, um, possibly San Francisco or San Diego, but um, in Vancouver, they're about to bring forward uh, some new uh, some new local code laws that are going to uh, make uh, carbon and the reuse of buildings um, a lot easier and uh, and and give some more uh, some more credence to that. So. Well, things are things are starting to happen. It's just what we're going to find now is we're just way behind, and we have to catch up. Um, so communicating uh, not just well, but quickly <laughs> is is really part of it, I think. And thanks, uh, thanks for that. And the comment uh, Lorna Crochu put in the chat about uh, the importance of integrating uh, Indigenous voices and Indigenous uh, traditional knowledge and stewardship of the land in these discussions. It's woven in there in the in the working groups uh, and that uh, that CHN and others have, uh, have put together. So uh, that's an important piece of the, uh, of the of the effort. Um, I think we're at the end of our time here. Yikes, we got scampered to the end of it. Um, so there was some good, you know, practical. I wanted to end on practical thoughts for people working at the local level to to enact. And I think you've given us some high level, very high level kind of ideas too around communicating both with numbers and with with words uh, through tools and other things. This has been so stimulating, and I really thank you very much for bringing us the word from the ground there in Glasgow, you and uh, Julianne, and also Mark. And uh, looking forward to the ongoing conversation. Please consider joining the um, Climate Heritage Network. Thanks for putting that up, Holly. Uh, you'll find that online uh, if you haven't already done so. And also, uh, we'll be sending out the recording of this uh, of this webinar and also the recording of the chat and uh, and other documents. And thank you very much for joining us and encourage you to see some of the things that the National Trust for Canada has up on its Regeneration Works website and to join us in membership as well. Thanks to our panelists and thank you to all those uh, joining us today for your attention and looking forward to the ongoing conversation. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks thank so much.